Welcome to Melrose Gallery London. I'm Eduardo Sestetic and we're here filming for the exhibition Ruins. This is going to be a kind of informal conversation, hence the glass of Prosecco, where I and the guys will take you through the work and coming in. This section of the show, we have the photography by Amelia Nanka. Uh, Amelia, would you like to give some words? I wanted to juxtapose the um, wanted to juxtapose the exposed bodies with the stark background, so that you see sort of strength and vulnerability within their bodies and create a sort of rawness because the, the power of that performance, for me, it came from that personal experience and try and mirror the themes that they talk about in their previous performance. Um, just reiterating that, Amelia has created these beautiful chiaroscuro um, these beautiful um, black and white images that capture vulnerability, a sense of sensuality, a sense of loss also, and ruins reminds me slightly of what, I think it reminds me a little bit of Freud's civilization as discontent. Because going through the exhibition, there's this deep sense of owing and sublimity, which I think is captured really quite humbly by these very brought back, stripped back images of just two men dancing in, in tandem. Uh, and I think it's an, correct me if I'm wrong, you guys can say something, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, the building was due for demolition, was it not? Closing down. Closing down. As a hot space. So the, the, the building was going oh, through a redevelopment. This, this was going for demolition, sorry. Um, the building was going through redevelopment, so there is a, a deep sense of loss because the community spaces were being taken over and turned into something completely different from what they were originally, and community is something in London that is at a premium currently. If you look at what's going on in, uh, you know, in Southwark, with the increasing gentrification and the moving out of the host communities for these new communities, which have been complicated by COVID, because a lot of the plans are just not financially viable anymore. So what does that look like now? Um, well, Let's also look at the video of the guys dancing. Whilst you look at these images, we're just waiting for the... Um... The video to start again. That's the beginning of uh, the video from Ruins. It's amazing. And you get a sense of uh, the strength of the performances and the vulnerability and, you know, just, just general, I don't know, guys fall in. What was, or how do you guys start off with a composition? 
I'd say um, we usually start with improvisation. That's a big uh, way of us uh, in terms of creation. It always starts from a very free and open place uh, because we're very informed by our bodies. Um, so we see what works and see what feels right, feels good, and then we move from that place and slowly the freedom starts to tunnel into something a bit more specific. Yeah. And then from there we find what the work says to us and what it means from there. Um, so it's never a kind of preconceived idea but more something that reveals itself to us in the process. I like the fact that as a work it talks about something very constructive which is the plan for re gentrification yes. of an area and And um, and your response to it is, is improvisation. So there's a mixture of two quite distinct elements there. One very structured, very sort of overpowering, mm -hmm. let's just say, because it it, it 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 ruins communities. It does. Gentrification takes away the overall of an area mm -hmm. so your response to it is to politicize the body and create via dance from a cross-disciplinary sense a very sort of political body do you agree or disagree I don't know I might be taking it a little bit too far mm. um, I think that I think for us in creating it, we didn't think about notions of gentrification in relation to ruins. Um, I think uh, ruins is, is, is really much more about, I think, just us trying to encapsulate our, our own life experience, I guess, just as, like, uh, as men and as black men. Um, mm. So I think the body is used in that sense in terms of creating a discord there and um, kind of opening the conversation about what is uh, what is masculinity, what is it to us, how does it inform us, how are we informed by it. But um, so I think it is more of a personal and a little bit more of an emotional journey than it is a political one. Okay, interesting you say that because. Currently, we're going through a whole series of world upheavals. Yeah, absolutely. Starting on actually my birthday, the 27th of May, when George Floyd died. Mm -hmm. And it, it's not, it didn't even just start there, you know, it started 200, 400, 500 years ago. Yeah. And reaching his apogee now, the black male, whatever he does or whatever they do, is considered to be political. Yeah. Mm -hmm. by, by no choice of our own. Exactly. So do you think a dancer who happens to be black speaking about issues like masculinity can be ever considered non-political? Um, I think it may be viewed politically sometimes but I think we should be given the same agency to just express our experiences the same way any other artist is. Um, I think when a white artist creates a work, it's not about it being white and political. It's just an experience that they've created a work from or it's an idea that they've developed. Um, so I understand because of the state of the world that we live in and just the way things are, uh, that is very relevant, um, that it can be politicized um, the intention was not to be political, although the work may reflect in that way. But I think that is more of a that says more about the viewer. the viewer as opposed to the performers. So uh, the performative gaze is quite an interesting mm -hmm. because at one level you are in essence, both of you creating a symbiosis and you have your own idea of what it is that you're doing. Mm -hmm. And we want to 
type of vulnerability and masculinity, um, the crisis of sexuality, and all sorts of other, mm-hmm. and all sorts of other sort of underlying issues that come with. But because your agency is also dictated by what happens outside of that sphere, mm-hmm. it ends up becoming a mishmash because you guys want to talk about sort of masculinity and the, and the crisis of masculinity and you know, celebrating your own found ontologies and people are there creating all sorts of other narratives around it. Mm-hmm. So how does a dancer in a non-verbal way communicate that struggle? I guess it's through the vulnerability, you know, how we how we communicate with each other mm-hmm. in that in that aspect, like performative. Because I've never seen, like personally, I've never seen two black men uh, being in a space and being vulnerable with each other, doing contact and these kind of movements. So I feel like it comes from that place of being able to be in a space with you and feel feel weak and feel um, like I can be soft and gentle. And these kind of themes which we don't see in real life, so we. Have to execute it on stage and also we try to you know hope that this develops into and feeds into our real life but it comes from that place of relationship mm. does that make sense it does infinite mm. infinite amounts of sense mm. um the term relationship is quite interesting mm. especially when it comes to vulnerability mm. and i don't know what what is your ideal of a dancer relationship because they can be quite fraught because of egos and mm. also other sort of artistic considerations mm. you know someone's body doesn't sometimes go as far as the other mm. and so how do you negotiate a dancerly relationship and and how do you also negotiate that into an abstract Um, I think Bruce touched upon it in a different question but it's this thing of like being informed by your body so I think for us uh, the work is physical it's very physical work the, in creation the last thing we are thinking about is how impressive can we physically be it's more about um, what serves the work mm. and the message that we're trying to maybe convey within it how do we cultivate uh, that into what it is that we make Um, and I think for us we're very open to uh, we work quite holistically so it's what it's about what feels good in the body in terms of what is what feels good for uh, the trajectory that the work is taking but also what feels good on our bodies too Mm. Um, because I think it's important to I don't believe in this like blood, sweat and tears analogy of life and like it's also about um, facilitating your own ability to be able to perform the work without destroying yourself too. So, um, because there is the idea of the tortured dancer. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And it's quite a destructive idea, the fact that you push your body to such Mm. a limit mm. but that idea in itself is also reflective of the tortured artist in general mm. and also reflective of the industrialization of, of bodies yeah. mm. so the fact that our expression is sort of stunted mm because we're, we're expected to be machines and mm. execute these movements mm. within society mm. that are just not very natural. Exactly. And it's also not like, it's not sustainable, um, if that makes sense. I think as a dancer, you have an expiring date in terms of physically where your body will take you. And mm. I think through time and with age, you know, you might have less available to you in terms of your facility. Um, and it's true, I think there is this whole analogy of like the 
so they don't know. They're tortured dancer, but I think that's quite a traditional mm. approach to dance, which still very much exists. Mm. And I think it depends on uh, where within dance you sit, because there are you know, practices and techniques where that very much is the way you do it. Um, I think we were quite fortunate to have uh, such a variety in our training and our nurturing of ourselves mm. as dancers that uh, we do take this holistic approach in the sense of there are things like you know somatic based practices that are more about um, working with the body and not against the body and mm. how does that create longevity for you as well um, mm. always moving from a place that uh, serves you as well uh, as serving the work I think sometimes as performers there's this idea that uh, the work comes first and we have to serve it regardless of what it does to us um, emotionally or physically. That's a real difficult point because if you, you, you're giving so much of yourself. Mm. And I, I would love to touch on something you said previously and echo that. Um, so what are the different intersections that you're working with in terms of dance styles that inform your work? What, you know, what is your, what is your basic sort of dance diet? Let's mm. put it that way. <laughs> yeah, that's, a, that's another one. Um, because me, me and Wada, we grew up in um, learning like hip hop and street dance. So there's a sense of like dynamic rhythm and texture there. And also just like culturally there's, um, you know, as black people, there's a, a thing with rhythm and music, a connection that kind of always exi has existed. Um, and then we go into like the, the training at like the conservatoires where we've just learned a handful of styles and rigorous techniques as well. Yeah, mm -hmm. like ballet contemporary and then other techniques like flying low and all of these different things. And, and we kind of flying low, it's um, it's a it's a <laughs> technique by uh, a guy called David Zambrano, and it's it's uh, improvisational, uh, but it's very much about spirals and going in and out of the floor. It's and a discipline. It's a discipline, and it's, it's about yeah, yeah, and it's about moving uh, with people. Um, but many of those different styles we've learned, and I feel like there's essences that uh, kind of feed into the work from everything. Yeah. And I don't think we restrict ourselves to um, a type of movement philosophy just yet because we're still growing as as a company but also as individuals mm. um, so this holistic approach I feel like we have and I feel like that's the point where we start from which is just listening to ourselves as uh, humans first and then seeing how we feel and then moving from that place um, we're not trying to to show anything specific or trying to be um, any type of style uh, but I think definitely the style that we use use the most is uh, partner work and improvisation and con a lot of contact and um, and that comes from that same place of listening uh, to another body and to yourself so uh, there's a combination between all those things but I couldn't tell you what exactly it is right now because it's, it's an ongoing journey mm. the practice is still developing and it's many things it is like you said it's, it's many things I don't think we want to bracket ourselves or put it in a box of this is what it is it's, it's um it is what it is it is what it is it's quite organic as well so it's it's like i said before it's about what feels right you know? at the time yeah as opposed to what looks good with, or as opposed to working against mm -hmm. um do you feel like you're creating your own language of dance because it's it's all right you say, in a way, that you're, it's undefinable to an extent what you're doing because you, mm. you don't want to be defined. Mm. But in, in the undefinable, you also create your own mm. movements, your yeah. own circles, your own sort of yeah. diet. Mm. Where, where are you, do you feel like you're going towards a language that you're, that you're sort of, I don't know, What's his name again? That dancer. Someone like um, Wayne McGregor has a language of dance. Mm. Do you feel like you're also stretching yourselves towards that? You're breaking down these barriers in the process of 
of doing it from contemporary to ballet to street, are you creating, I don't know, free food language? I, I feel like the only style we're um, creating is uh, one that's healthy for the body. And um, I don't know, I'm gonna like keep on going back to this holistic approach because it's something, uh, when we talk about like the tortured dancer, um, it's the tortured dancer that can't like sustain their bodies until they get to like 60 or 70 um, because it's, you know, this, or if they've been doing ballet, there's so much restrictions on it and the body turns and distorts in ways that's not natural. Um, so the, the kind of direction I am and I think Wada is leaning towards is one of like health and, um, and, and care for the body. Uh, so anything that kind of is in, in that bubble or um, surrounds that kind of feeling of uh, mm. caring for yourself, I feel like that's the direction I would go in. Um, which isn't, you know, so these other choreographers that you mentioned there, uh, their styles and techniques um, are mainly focused on like showing something. Mm -hmm. and, and the work that we do isn't focused on showing something, it's something that we experience and other people, well, we hope yeah. for them to experience when they come to see it. So it's a very hard question to answer and if you compare it to like someone like Wayne McGregor because he does something completely different. Um, but like Flying Low, for example, uh, that technique has grown from um, from an injury that uh, David Zambrano had and then he had to kind of figure out new pathways in his body so that he could sustain himself as a mm. dancer. So, um, so yeah, I mean, I'm interested in that and what that has, and it's not, it doesn't have to be performative, mm. but more experiential. Yeah. I think it's also forever changing. Yeah. And I think we're open to that. Um, I think that's quite important Entry. for us. Yeah, it's forever changing, it's never fixed. Um, and I think that just allows room for progression and evolution. Um, yeah, and permanence. Like, yeah, 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 absolutely. Going from those very philosophical, lofty heights, <laughs> let's talk about um, something a little bit less glamorous. Okay. Um, how, as a company, do you guys see the art world or the dance world going in these most changeable times, let's put it? Because dance is not synonymous with being a place in which, one, there's a lot of longevity anyway, so you're always, again, going to be you're always in entropy, you're always in change. Mm -hmm. But this, you know, this recession that we're in, man, man, not man-made, but man-made in the sense that man has decided to shut down everything. How are you guys sort of navigating that process and finding your feet again mm -hmm. in this new normal? Mm. I think um, we're still in that phase of exploring that too, because. Uh, we're equally as affected by the surprise of it as everyone else. However, prior to being struck by a pandemic and everything locking down and things changing, mm -hmm. we had always had this intention um, to work in a very multidisciplinary way. So in terms of being dancers and being from that world, I think long before COVID was even a thing, we always knew that we wanted to be a dance company that exists beyond the theater and beyond the stage. Um, and it's why we put together things like this, where we work with still images and with film. And if you came on Monday, the, what date was it? Monday, 3rd, 7th. Monday, Monday the 7th, we performed an excerpt from it outdoors to, you know, adhere to, guidelines and restrictions um, but I think for us it's kind of keeping with the mission of just uh, doing more things that are a little bit different maybe for a, for a dance mm. um, and not everything has to be a live performance and not everything has to be in a theatre and I think that's a real interest for us to investigate further so I think it's about us moving forward and kind of just continuing to adapt um, and I think if anything this time has just maybe highlighted that we need to place more emphasis on um, yeah, the offstage stuff that we want to do and we are doing. And uh, no, I think this is the opportunity to nurture that more. 
So it's things like we were in the process of, you know, uh, r and a new show that was, uh, you know, that is a live performance. And we've had conversations, nothing's definitive yet, about, oh, well, maybe given the times we're in, maybe we should make it a film instead. And so it's about just adapting. In pivoting. That, yeah, pivoting and adapting in that sense to, um, to what, what is going to serve us well as artists, but also where we can get the accessibility to be artists. Because we've we've um, we've said this before, like before the pandemic hit, everything kind of got a bit isolated. Um, we've always kind of like said that we like to work in like a multidisciplinary fashion. So the timing has been divine in the sense of what we've been able to do with this. Um, mm. But it's always been a conversation from before this mm. that we wanted the work to exist without without us being there physically. Um, so this is something that's uh, I feel like it's the right pathway for us in terms of we're still still able to navigate on um, in this kind of in this day like today because we we don't place like just a high value on live performance uh, we place a value on collaboration. as well for the photos thank you to Donny Sunshine for the film uh, thank you to everybody who's involved in this project there's a lot of a lot of hands in the pot that kind of made this, this possible happen. yeah so um, and yeah, that's, that's the ethos of it it's not just uh, reason why it's, it's everyone it's Fubu Nation so it's very much a collective it's a nation it's yeah. yeah it is yeah. well done thank you Should I stop it? Do you, okay.